pulled out of it is something that you've been saying over the past few weeks, and that is is that um, we have the intention within us to uh, change everything. There's nothing locked in stone. There were no prophecies that were ever locked in stone. All prophecies that were given could be abrogated. The, the negative effects of them could be abrogated by simply the people waking up and, uh, and being conscious of who they are and their relationship to each other and to the universe. So. Well, that's exactly right. And, and the key to prophecy, remember always, is revelation. I mean, a prophecy sits in, so for example, the book of Revelation. And the key to the book of Revelation is that word revelation. All those symbols mean absolutely nothing until the correct revelation reveals the spectacular uh, significance of them. And uh, it's, it's terribly sad when people are, uh, are taught to take prophecy literally. Prophecy is never, ever supposed to be taken literally. It, it's, it is, in its revelation, it's true. Now, if revelation can prove literal and metaphysical, allegorical uh, and historical, then truly that is revelation of the divine. And again, we're at a very exciting time when those things come to play. Look, I really appreciate it, Greg, and I appreciate all you're doing. And, and I hope and encourage, I hope you will get back on to actually speaking on air again soon because I think uh, people miss that. And uh, you did a fine, fine job. I hope you'll go back and do that as well soon. Okay, well, maybe we'll build another talk to you to start supporting Acadia and then open it up to a different view of, of uh, making this go to a wider audience. I'd be happy to talk well, about I, that. I know people would appreciate it, Greg, but I know it's always difficult. We've got to survive, but good on you for what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, Frank. Uh-huh. All right, Frank. A uh, question I want to get to over in the chat that's uh, been hanging out here for just a little bit. Uh, what about the exclusive legislative authority, territorial jurist, to enforce written law on a geographic location outside the proprietary? Yeah, it's um, you dropped off at the back end there, but um, I think the uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, so the question is, are they talking about... Do we know what the question is? Quite, I'm not quite sure. I'm looking for it here in the chat. Uh, uh, it was shortly after you came back. If you go back to the top of your oh, chat... Oh, here we go. Uh-huh. I'll get to see it now. Exclusively, this the authority territorial jurors to enforce written law on a geographical location outside of, of their proprietary power. Um, okay, I'm not too sure if Guest 37 is, is questioning it as something that could be applied to Eucadia or whether they, whether they are seeking to talk about um, uh, a particular right um, about the existing system when they talk about jurisdiction, being personal, territorial, and subject matter. Um, because of that, I'm not quite sure exactly how to answer it. If the question is about Eucadia, and does Eucadia claim any kind of uh, right, territorial right, uh, of, of uh, enforcement and jurisdiction, the answer is absolutely yes. And I encourage everyone to go and read the front pronouncement of the covenant to see that very clearly established. And the way that is established is in mirroring a recognition that the current system actually claims its right spiritually first. It doesn't claim it physically first, it claims it spiritually first. And people forget that. They think that the armies, the military, the sheriffs, and all the guns and steel is what keeps the system in power. It's not. The idea keeps it in power. And the idea is that they are granted their rights by God. That's what they claim. That's what holds them in power. All of the guns, the, the steel, the military does is reinforce that idea. That's all it does. So go and have a look at the 
opening of the covenant in one heaven. As to their system, well, I, I encourage um, Guest 37 to go and have a look at uh, the sections there on positive law about jurisdiction. And they are listed under uh, section 7.7. 7. 283, 284, 586 gives quite a bit of detail as to our opinion on the right of territorial jurisdiction. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah? Yeah, I think you covered both sides about it. it you know, it was, it, it was kind of a vague question, but with this go, question went back to when we were discussing the uh, census and those issues as far as jurisdiction okay. and those kinds of things. So it seems to be more tied into the system and uh, the enforcement that they use possibly. So um, now let's go back to, I've got another question here, or maybe a statement or that wants a little bit of feedback from you from guest five, you see, uh, about them receiving the uh, Prudential Restitutum, Restitutum from the Treasury Secretary. And yeah. the Secretariat has no mandate to deal with this matter. And the cor- your correspondence is hereby returned to you. That was the response they got. Do you have any feedback on that? Yeah, well, a m- mandate, um, mandamus is a command. And so, so what they're saying is um, this is now their way of kind of uh, flicking it off by saying um, we do not have the authority to deal with this matter. And they're using the nefarious word mandate to hide authority. If they said the word we have no authority, then they would feel that um, obviously that's uh, letting the cat a bit more out of the bag. The word mandate is a little bit more um, uh, less understood, but it, it effectively it's just the same thing. They're saying we have no authority to deal with this matter. Um, and uh, in a sense, um, the question is, you know, is that accurate? Is that not accurate? Uh, this is their way in correspondence of um, saying you didn't ask the magic word, you didn't give us the magic sign, you didn't open the magic door. What we need to do with our material, and I think this is for everybody, um, by intent, uh, the work that people have done in sending off the ecclesiastical deed polls could not be clearer, could not be clearer that we are not slaves. They, being pedants, continue to hide behind regulation, statutes, and uh, procedure. Because in their world, procedure is the law. Principle isn't law, intent isn't law. They now hide and say procedure is the law. So what we need to do is refine what we're doing so that we don't keep um, firing letters over one another and getting this kind of dead response. I believe that our presumptions and the way that we handle the future will be more towards the negative averment where we will make the presumption that their silence and their failure to respond appropriately will be their consent. And so we will be refining the material. It doesn't mean that if someone sent something and they're getting this response that what they've done is wrong. I really, really want to make that clear. Never even now, with all that we've learned, the first version of the EDPs and now the version we're doing now, at no point have I seen anything to, to negate the validity of what has been said. All that's changing is that we become less and less uh, uncertain, less and less unsure in our language, become clearer that we know who we are, we know what they are. And, uh, and it would be remiss of us not to reflect that knowledge. So the answer, they've sent that back. Should you respond to them? I don't think there's any benefit in responding at this point. Give us a chance to, to sell the material, and maybe, yes, you can respond to them with a negative averment. But at this point, we're still upgrading the material. But I do appreciate the feedback. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Frank. All right, back to Ron on the phone. Ron? Hey, Ron. Hey, I'm here. Okay. Frank? Ron? Do you mind if um, I talk a little bit about Ellen? 
Uh, yeah. mm, no, it's, because I know it's there, but but I just want to paraphrase it. It's 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 an issue that's sucking a lot of activity on people. Yeah, I know. But far away, probably oh, justifiably so. It, go, go for it, Ron. Go. It, it it's just that I I put a lot of study into it, and I have finally figured out. Um, what what is going on? Okay, I thought for a long time that LNN was actually Nibiru or Planet X because nobody could prove otherwise. Well, I uh, just recently, within the last two days, three days, I read this very long article from this astronomer. It sounds like an astronomer that wrote it. Um, planet, well, LNN is a comet. It's only maybe five kilometers across. And it will pass Earth exactly the way JPL has predicted it. But, and the, and the Hopi call that the Blue Kachina in their prophecies. Right. Now, 8 AU behind Elenin is the brown dwarf, Is can only be seen with infrared telescopes, and I have the coordinates, but I haven't figured out how to use Worldwide Telescope yet. It's a program that Microsoft has for free. Really complicated. Anyway, so 8AU behind is the dark star, which we could call Planet X or Nibiru. It will pass next year in front of Earth exactly the same time that LNN will. So it's... a uh, is is just coming in one year later, okay? Now, this this comes right along your theories of redemption, end of days, and all of that, okay? Elenin is a harbinger of things to come. We need yes. to get ready. That's what I wanted to say about that. Well, look, I don't begrudge anyone that, that, that plans for their own survival. I think uh, collectively as a species, um, if there's opportunity to, to plan for survival and one didn't, then that would be like the three little pigs with the straw. Sorry I'm on the pig thing tonight, but anyway. <laughs> so the pig analogy. Um, but no, when it I, comes I'm to... not talking about physical, I'm talking about spiritual. Sure, sure. But, but well, here's, here's, here's a couple of things that I think are, are really, really in, important. When I went through and did all the research on uh, Book of the Green Race and went back into times of great disaster, and there's been many, many times of great disaster, the whole of North Africa, the whole Saudi Peninsula, the whole Levant, right across the Mediterranean, I mean, Greece didn't get to the way it was because it was born naturally. Look at Greece, and I can tell you that Greece got hammered for a long period, absolutely hammered yep. to create the way Greece is today. And so did Bell back. from volcanoes. So yeah. the thing is that um, when I looked at that history, the one thing that was missing wasn't that society picked itself up again and kept going, life kept going, that, that whatever happened on the earth, that it happened for a reason. It was how the event transformed the world to something better as opposed to something worse. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the sad fact is that for all the negativity and all the greed and all the avarice of the last hundreds of years, I see very, very few that have gone the hard yards to create a model of law and the frameworks of society that would allow us, regardless of the technology, allow us to live a better way than the way we've been living. Now, some say, and I've had this argument, sorry, Ron, sorry to you, I'm so talking to you, but oh, okay. um, I've, I've, I've had the argument where people say, well, the Ten Commandments tell me enough, or the Torah tells me life or the Bible tells me life. I understand that and, I, and I'm that's fine but but I'm not talking about uh, living in a in a in an absolute that that really would ultimately if you think about it if you want to live to the absolute law then that's called Sharia law you want to see law that that does not account for uh, 
the golden rule, then see how Sharia law is trying